Good morning, everyone. My name is Ray Pennings. I'm the Executive Vice President and Co-Founder of CARTIS. And uh, through our Faith in Canada 150 um, initiative, we are very uh, pleased to be co-sponsoring and participating in this particular conference. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with CARTIS and our Faith in Canada 150 initiative, uh, there's a website, faithincanada150.ca. We are seeking to engage communities of faith to celebrate Canada's sequicentennial. There's a complete range of activities that um, Canada's third largest literary prize, $25,000 purse. Uh, there's up to $5,000 for your story on a thread of 1,000 stories. There's a millennial conference. There's polling. There are lots of things. I'm not going to turn this into a commercial, but faithincanada150.ca. In case you didn't get that, faithincanada150.ca um, certainly fills in the details. But this morning we're here to, um, to talk about immigration and refugees in Canada, which indeed is one of the legacies as well of Faith in Canada 150. Um, throughout Canada's history, those who have been here before have been very welcoming to newcomers who have come, and most of us have come um, in relatively recent generations, actually, uh, to this country. We are a country of immigrants, and uh, the role of faith communities in welcoming immigrants is something that we want to turn our attention to this, this morning. And to do that, we have three very qualified panelists in the age of, um, of Google, in which you can find out all of the details of the uh, resumes far beyond what is in your program. I'm not going to read the entire um, resumes of each. Um, simply, and I'll invite the three of you forward. Uh, Rita Shahal is the Executive Director of the Manitoba Interfaith Immigration Council. Um, I didn't know any of these people prior to simply making the arrangements for this conference, but we had an opportunity to ch chat a bit yesterday. Not only does she bring professional credentials, but clearly um, an invigorating story from her own experiences as well. And uh, so she'll be our first speaker. The second will be Dr. Mar Dr. Martin Mark. Dr. Mark is the coordinator for the Refugee Resettlement Program of the Toronto Diocese uh, of the Roman Catholic Church and uh, has a long history and experience, has served various committees and shared his expertise uh, throughout. I believe he's been in over 60 countries, if I uh, read the uh, biography correctly. And then thirdly, we'll have uh, Professor Howard Edelman, a professor emeritus from North University who uh, has written extensively also on themes related to this. So we have uh, three very qualified presenters, so I won't take any more time. I'll invite them to come forward. Uh, they, will, um, they will speak in the order that I um, named them for um, 10 minutes each, and then we'll have the opportunity, as, as we did yesterday, to engage the rest of the time in conversation. So Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for your um, kind invitation. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, but it's also very humbling to be amongst all of you, to be um, among such learned company, um, bishops, theologians, academics, and ordinary everyday citizens who give so much to our country. That is ex indeed very, very humbling on a very personal note. Uh, it's also very meaningful for me to be uh, speaking uh, on this occasion in celebration of our country's 150th, because it was 50 years ago that I arrived in Canada uh, with my parents, and I was about this high. Um, my, my, my comments and my, uh, my presentation is very much about, a bit about a personal journey, and I'll, and I'll weave into um, it uh, a little bit about my professional background, but it really is a personal, a personal story. Um, and and the, f the role uh, that faith has played in where I've been and where I am and perhaps where I might be. Um, I'll share with you my Canadian connections, which <laughs> was uh, alluded to a little bit earlier, um, before I even came to Canada. My parents were married um, by a um, Canadian missionary, Dr. Dustin from Newfoundland, 
in India. I was born in a hospital called Maple Leaf Hospital, delivered by a Canadian missionary doctor from Southern Ontario. And my early schooling was um, in, a, in a very British school in India uh, with, a, again, a Canadian missionary. The same um, um, Dr. Dustin who married my parents was also the headmaster of, the, of that school. Um, so very early connections. Uh, it was meant to be. Uh, we were supposed to come to Canada, and we arrived 50 years ago, uh, touched down on Gander, Newfoundland, and ended up at Pier 21 in Halifax. So many of you might be familiar with Pier, Pier 21. Um, we ended up uh, within about a week uh, uh, or a couple of days before Christmas in Prince Edward Island, and uh, we were the first complete family of East Indian descent. In fact, one of the, the first families of color um, uh, on the island, which in, in itself is an experience. Uh, um, going to Prince Edward Island if you're not an, an, an islander. Um, and of course, we, um, the, the church, uh, St. Paul's Anglican Church uh, in Charlottetown and others um, uh, in, in, in Prince Edward Island had a huge impact on our early settlement. Now, I share a little bit about that with you because we came to Canada. My parents chose to come to Canada. And how and why they ended up in Canada, and particularly in Prince Edward Island, is a, and another lovely story for another conversation. So maybe I'll get an invitation back and I'll share that with you. Um, but 50 years later, um, here I am, now executive director um, of an institution much like Pier 21. Uh, and where we welcome refugees from around the world. Pier 21, if those of you are familiar, was a place where immigrants from around the world, particularly Europe, came and started their journey and moved to other parts of the country. So Pier, uh, for Welcome Place, which is a, um, 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 one of the largest settlement agencies in Manitoba, and as the name suggests, Manitoba Interfaith Immigration Council has been around for about 70 years. It's governed by a, a, um, an interfaith board um, and that includes mainstream uh, representation, but also uh, representation from Hindus, Sikh, um, um, other faiths that you know are not considered traditional, but there is representation on that from, from all over, and, and, and those are representatives that are assigned um, by their, their faith groups rather than we go and, and solicit for that. So that's a bit, it's a bit of a unique model and I don't have too much time to get into the details. But what we do is we welcome refugees from around the world. And that's why we're called Welcome Place, affectionately called Welcome Place. And I share the piece about the choice with you earlier. The reason being is that there are major differences between immigrants, which my parents and I were, and refugees. Most of you probably you know, understand that, that immigrants have a choice where they want to go, where they want to live, how they want to live, how much money they're going to bring, um, um, the language uh, you know, it, uh, the, uh, is, is often there. Whereas refugees do not have those choices. They have been displaced. No one ever wants to be a refugee at least not one that I've heard from yet that, that said I wanted to be a refugee. Um, they've been displaced because of war, persecution, uh, civil unrest, political views, and a whole host of things that you and I probably don't even, you know, can't even imagine the reasons why people are experiencing persecution, particularly in some of the, uh, you know, we've, there are 65, displaced, uh, 65 million displaced individuals right now, according to UNHCR. Um, and why, do, why does that even have to happen? Why do we even have to have that conversation? Why are people being displaced? Um, the Canadian settlement model is one that is envied around the world. Again, uh, 10 minutes is not enough to go into the entire Canadian, uh, uh, into our settlement model, but one that we have at Welcome Place I can share very quickly with you. Uh, as the largest settlement agency, we provide um, services in over 30 languages. About 90% of my staff are former refugees, so they have a real 
very good understanding of what the needs of the, of the, uh, the, the clients that are coming in. We get clients from all over the world. Um, we have programs such as um, basic life skills. We have, um, um, you know, we, we transition them from temporary to permanent housing. We get them um, basic um, services such as make sure that the medical needs are met, make sure that the children are in school. Just very basic things you and I take for granted, getting a bank account open. Those are some of the very um, core parts of our services. The core programs that we provide services for are for three groups of refugees. One is the government-assisted refugees, which most of you know about, uh, and because they have been in the news. And those are the ones that are sanctioned through the UNHCR and have been invited to come to Canada uh, and to, to, to um, uh, you know, be protected under Canadian law. The second group that we provide services to are the privately sponsored. Again, many of you may already be involved with, with private sponsorship, so you know about that and you know what your role and responsibility is and you know what types of services the, go the government can help provide for that. The third group is, of course, where you have been hearing about most recently in Manitoba, is the refugee claimants. Those who are crossing the border in an irregular manner, for lack of a better, an, a, a, a different word, um, and who are seeking protection under Canadian law, under international humanitarian law, because they are entitled, they are entitled to ask for protection under those laws. Um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that they will get a permission to stay in Canada, but it is a fair process. And that's what's, what's wonderful about our country, is that we do have processes that are fair and equitable. Uh, Welcome Places basic programs and, and um, services are based on uh, mutual trust and respect. And we don't focus on numbers. We don't really worry about how many people are coming and not coming. Um, but we do worry, about what we do focus on is mutual trust and respect. Um, and the bell has rung. Um, the role of faith community in Canada, uh, th this has been a question that's been asked. Um, absolutely, I think it's absolutely critical that the, uh, the faith community have a role in the, in, in the settlement um, in our country. Because one of the first things that newcomers look for is a place of worship, because that's where they feel the, the support system that has to take to place and successful integration. I do, however, think that there are some words of caution um, as we ensure that um, uh, the faith community, um, how it can support, because sometimes what happens, and, and we've seen this happen in, in certainly in Manitoba and I'm sure in other communities across the country, that there become personal agendas when there are divided groups within an ethnocultural community, particularly faith communities, that they might, there, there have been moments of personal agendas where people are trying to gain, um, you know, uh, memberships into their community, and that often divides the community. Uh, and sometimes on, uh, you know, um, using faith as, as, as a way to divide. And I think those are some of the things that we have to be concerned about. Um, and, uh, you know, I may later, perhaps later I can give some examples. But I do want to end with a very personal uh, note in philosophy that has guided me and I hope will continue to guide me. And that is um, the words in, in Corinthians where um, the, there is talk about faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. That is my, my personal uh, um, journey that, that I walk on. And Manitoba is often known uh, for the work of Nellie McClung um, who taught us about the importance of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, our rights and freedoms. I hope as an individual um, that I can share and as a, as a newcomer and one of the, whose choice it is to be in Canada, that indeed um, we can be, we need to be keepers of our brothers and sisters. So thank you for taking time and I apologize for going over for a couple of minutes, but I hope to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, I feel really good because thank you for the invitation. And uh, the setting is very similar to my daily job because 
working for the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto in the refugee office, is basically um, presenting in front of a lot of interested people about refugees, trying to sell them the cause. And I was even planning to make a joke that uh, at the end of my presentation, I would distribute a sign-up sheet that, okay, how many refugees you are willing to sponsor? Because that is how we measure our, our uh, success. Like, uh, how the program works in, in my office that, uh, like, I started about uh, nearly 20 years ago, and, and the whole budget was my salary with office overhead. And the idea is that it is my job and my colleagues, now we have a team of 15 <coughs> working for refugee resettlement in the Archdiocese of Toronto. Our job is to convince people, regardless who they are, uh, to help refugees. And the job is done by those volunteers. So there is no automatic budget like you know, some international agencies, they have that like, okay, you can resettle this many people and you have the budget and you go ahead. No, um, if we do a bad job or if the newcomer doesn't really follow or, or, or uh, get a good expectation, expected result uh, at the end of the process, at the end of the first year, then we lose sponsors. Then we don't have people to, to help refugees. So it's, it's really a very uh, motivating <laughs> factor that like if we want to survive, if we want to continue, if we want to go ahead with, with the numbers uh, and, and to help really people, as it was mentioned, that like we have 65 million displaced people now, it it's resembles to uh, World War II when, when uh, such a large uh, number of people were uprooted. And, and in the environment where you see that the uh, largest resettlement country, the US, uh, dramatically stopped processing cases, so that means that uh, their plan of resettling 100,000, which is just a drop in the sea. However, when you go to a refugee community, that drop, that, that from the community there is one person who will be selected and the person will be able to start a new life and will be able to give back to the rest of the community, it helps to the rest of the community. And, and now, uh, while the US already processed over 40,000 refugees and they decided that this year uh, the, the ceiling will be 50,000 instead of the 100,000. So the remaining is really not a significant number if you see on a global level. Um, Canada remains the only large resettlement country. So it is very important what we do and how we do. And, and let's see that basically how uh, in my job I meet different people and how uh, fate affects on, on uh, the plight of refugees. We established Catholics Without Borders, Catholics Sans Frontier, about uh, seven, nine years ago, when uh, with different group of volunteers, we went to different communities and refugee camps to select, identify, and process refugee cases for resettlement. So it means that like in our sponsorship uh, program, yes, we have a large factor of family uh, reunification, when people can initiate resettlement, with um, refugee background or, or uh, having relatives with in, in a refugee camp setting who would qualify for the program. However, we wanted to ensure that, uh, and Archbishop Collins of Toronto was very vocal on that, let's be the voice of the voiceless. Those who are not selected by the UN, those who have no relatives, those who, who maybe couldn't even register. You know, like we have a lot of people, especially uh, religious minorities, who have serious difficulties to, to approach the International Refugee Agency for registration. Now, if you are not registered, then how you can be referred and selected for resettlement? How you can get durable solution? There is no way. So, so under Catholic Sans Frontier, Catholics Without Borders, we go to different parts of the world and uh, basically, we interview people, we work together with the stakeholders, people who serve refugees on the ground. We, we collaborate with the UN Refugee Agency and the Canadian Embassy. And in this way, we try to uh, help as many people as possible, especially those who are not so strong to, to uh, advocate for themselves. When I started to work for the Archdiocese, we had a very small caseload. That means that uh, uh, it was a, a, let's just say, a one-digit <laughs> number identifying the, the files in process. Right now in the Archdiocese of Toronto, we are processing around 4,000 refugees. So when you see the number of submissions and arrival and one year uh, after arrival when our responsibility finish, uh, right now we are dealing with about 4,000 refugees uh, worldwide. Uh, 
Uh, how it started, well, it was interesting to see that 10 years ago when uh, Archbishop Collins became the, the Bishop of Toronto, uh, already in his fir first homily, two times he mentioned refugees. So I, I, was, I was really astonished, you know, because <laughs> I mean, I just went there, you know, as you have to go, your new bishop is there, let's listen to him and so on. And, and then I said, okay, like maybe we have something changed. And within two years, he established ORA, the Office for Refugees at the Archdiocese of Toronto, which is a separate entity, a department, and is directly under him. It's part of the Curia, it's part of the Pastoral Center. So he said that the concept of dele delegating resettlement to a settlement agency might be fine, but he wanted to personally overview and motivate and, and to ensure that uh, things are going well. So our office, which is mainly focusing on resettlement under the SA agreement, the Sponsorship Agreement, Holders Agreement, uh, is, is overviewed by the Chancellor directly, and that makes a huge difference when you talk with uh, members of the faith community, regardless whether they are Catholics or others. So, I could see clearly what changed in the last 20 years, not only in the Catholic Church, not only in our program, but even generally, that like how the perception of helping uh, refugees uh, changed. And it was very interesting that in the election uh, campaign, once I was invited in a morning show in the TV, and then they asked me that like, okay, how do I feel about uh, the situation? And I said, I love to, I just came back from Europe, and I said, I love to live in this country where you know what, the number one news is about refugees and only the number two news was that Canada is heading recession economy, you know? Like, I mean, <laughs> that shows a huge difference. And uh, in February when I was in New Zealand at the, at the United Nations um, uh, tripartite meeting, it was really interesting to see that 90% that of the people in the room coming from all over uh, the world where they do resettlement, where they deal with refugees, uh, and their problem is basically that how to limit it, how to decrease the numbers, how to stop uh, helping refugees because their people or they feel that, that most of the society over there uh, doesn't want migrants to come. And then uh, basically the Canadian delegates, we were the, the, the funny uh, people in the room that like we said, we have the opposite problem actually. And I, I even had a challenge with Immigration Canada uh, uh, in, in the meeting, on a side meeting, uh, fortunately, that like how can you decrease numbers at a time of the crisis like this? We have interest, we have huge pressure from Canadians. I mean from refugees, yes, we get the pressure, they need help, but you know, the Canadians, they just come in the room. They don't even knock. They say that like basically they want to have uh, their own refugee. They want to resettle. They want to do a job. And we unfortunately have limits. In, in the year of 2016, uh, our archdiocese initiated to resettle uh, 1,200 refugees together with different faith communities, uh, universities, and, and different other groups. Um, in 2015, we were allowed to submit 2,400 application. Um, in this year, unfortunately, the, the quota was 375. And uh, just coming last week from West Africa, um, when you talk with the visa office serving uh, uh, 12 uh, West African countries, I mean refugees uh, residing in these countries, and you learn that the latest uh, uh, decision of the government was to reduce the number, so from those countries in West Africa in this year, only 40 refugees can come. Uh, in light of having uh, Darfur, Sudan, the genocide going on, in light of no other countries willing to resettle Sudanese generally, uh, to get this dramatic change result in one, and that is that people are heading the Mediterranean, they are going to try to cross the sea and they are dying. It's, it's very dramatic. If you cut the hope, if you don't stand up to say this is wrong, the result is coming within a few months, within a year. Last year I had my uh, most dramatic visit uh, um, in, in my life in Kurdistan um, to visit Yazidis, internally displaced people. Uh, we have a, a wonderful group led by a Jewish uh, organization, Mozud, human rights organization, and under Project Abraham, we initiated to resettle um, Yazidi families. And basically, 
when I say that you can go all around the world, different countries, you can see refugees in horrible situation, but when you see how abandoned, abused, and, and ill-treated the Yazidi people, and practically and generally until now, we didn't have a possibility to help them. It, it, it was devastating. I was very, very uh, happy to hear that finally there is a decision and the Yazidis are coming. So I think that would be the best test to cooperate on an interfaith base to welcome these people who are really, really abandoned by, abandoned by everyone. Thank you. I'm going to do something a little bit different, <coughs> is uh, go back to some of the broader questions which we were asked to address uh, to d try to develop a broader framework. Um, and I'll refer to a few narrative stories of refugee issues, some of which will run counter to the, uh, if I want to call it, the correct thinking of this conference. Um, and it's based on research and it's based on direct involvement in the refugee movement. Uh, the role of faith groups, for example, was one of the questions. And you can tell one role back in 79, at the time of the Indochinese refugee crisis, uh, the role of the <coughs> faith groups were, were, were centralized with the Mennonites, and the Dutch Reformed, later the Christian Reformed Church. The regular line churches, the Catholics, the United Church, even the Jews weren't yet involved. They became involved with Project 4000, with, uh, with the Operation Lifeline, and, but at that, that time there was a partnership between the secular and the faith groups. Uh, they worked very closely together. What has happened in the last period, 40 years, is the faith groups are the ones that have taken over. But they've taken over when there's been a decline in the membership in faith groups. The effective result is you get 4,000 backed up, but whereas we could take 160,000 Indo-Chinese and in fact 60,000 in one year, when you come to the Syrians, we celebrate when we take 25,000 and the crisis is at least four times as bad. And our country is much richer and larger. So we're doing a far worse job than we were doing back then. And why? The churches and the synagogues and other places are doing more. And it has to do with the decline of an institutional role of giving, which is lack lacking in the secular society. We did it in Operation Lifeline because of circumstances at the time, it takes a different history. But that's a critical role to understand for the <coughs> faith communities. There's a, <coughs> a discussion here of ethical secularism, which I found didn't touch with my experience. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I sort of do. Uh, but in fact, I've found in Canada the faith communities are extremely involved in politics. Uh, they've, I've seen it in my whole experience of working with refugees over all the years. Sometimes negatively, when it came to the Jews, when it came to the Chinese, when it came to the Japanese, there was a statement just earlier about how Canada has always welcomed refugees. That's bull. Uh, it's utter bull. Uh, we were terrible. We had the worst record in treating the Jews of any country in the Western world. Uh, our treatment of the Chinese was horrendous. We already heard the story of the Japanese uh, yesterday. We've gone uh, uh, through a, a, a significant transition. And one of the things you find uh, between immigrants and refugees, immigrants are helped by their own people largely. You were helped by Anglicans, you were an Anglican. Uh, if you come from uh, one community, you're usually helped by members of your own community. Refugees 
are really helped by other communities if they're privately sponsored. When they're privately sponsored, you find different results than if they're government sponsored. You do research 10 years later, even though in the first year, uh, government sponsored refugees do better economically, uh, privately sponsored refugees are better off 10 years later. Further, they actually have Canadian friends, Canadian born friends. Government sponsored refugees don't. And one of the questions about integration is to address that issue and figure out whether we can be doing a better job. Further, when you do research on why people do and sponsor refugees, you find it's not faith that makes them work. You think it is because they belong to faith groups, but it's historical memory. And we had that John really talking about that yesterday. The narrative, and that's why you could see the Mennonites and the Dutch Reformed Church, for their various differences I have to go into, and then the Jews following a few months later, taking a predominant part because of their experience. When we started Operation Lifeline, the first people who came to the door on the Monday morning were Ugandan Asians with a pile of money in their hands that they'd collected just that morning. Uh, and they wanted to give it to help refugees. We didn't take money, so we insisted they go use it for sponsorship. But it was based on their experience. We had brought Ugandan Asians here. Now, uh, there's differences too. Let me tell you a story. At Cecil Street, uh, <clears throat> which is the Chinese community center in Toronto, um, we were welcoming uh, the first group of Indo-Chinese refugees. They were ethnic Chinese because the ethnic Chinese were the first people being ethnically cleansed from, uh, from Indo uh, Vietnam. <clears throat> and all of us who were supposed VIPs uh, were welcoming them. And it didn't matter who we, we came from, government officials, mayors, who were, the speeches were all the same. And what we said is, you're just like us. We, too, were immigrants or refugees. Our families, this is a country made by immigrants and refugees. It was a bit boring after a while. Um, then you heard the translations, I had a person translating for me, from Cantonese. What were they being told, the refugees, from the Cantonese? Don't let us down, don't shame us, don't cook with fish oil with your sponsors. You can't do this and you can't do that because you will disgrace our community. And you see, there's two different mindsets going on. Here's this generous, empty, uh, I'd say, abstract rhetoric. Uh, and then the reality of it. The reality is there's differences. Power differences, economic differences, consciousness differences, which we tend to hide and we don't confront. Now, I want to get back, I said, to a larger framework, so I'll, I'll not tell a lot of other stories, I have tons of them, based on research and based on everything else, to make a point. That what we are talking about here is the civil religion of Canada. That's what I've observed. I sat here all day yesterday, and you hear it articulated. There is a Canadian civil religion, and its first premise is civility. And the best way to understand, I'll go through a number of adjectives I picked up yesterday and contrast them with the uncivil religion that has arisen in the United States. We have it in Canada, but it's repressed. And part of our success is the repression of it. We talk about tolerance, but we repress. And if we don't repress, we'll go the other way. The United States, the repress factor has taken over. The uncivil, what I call the pissiness of the United States. <laughs> we have a second kind of category, compassion. It was mentioned yesterday, uh, charity. But why did Hillary lose? Hillary lost, one of the reasons, she didn't have passion. Who took over? Somebody with a passion for power, for his own interest. But passion counted far more than compassion. 
And it's the, the nature of the uncivil religion. Dignity. We talked about yesterday about the dignity of the other. Well, if you want to see examples of indignation and lack of dignity, it doesn't take far. We see it on CNN and Fox News all the time. Diversity. Celebrated all over. This is an example. We love diversity. But if you look at the language, the language of the under uh, uncivil religion is not respecting the dignity, it's fighting for the unity. And therefore, when you have on your sign solidarity, I'm puzzled by it. Because solidarity is about unity, and I don't see solidarity here, I see working together, but there isn't the one kind of thing, and that's what John said yesterday in his speech. There's various narratives, and you have to talk to each other, but there's not a solidarity among them. There's a working together, a practical way of doing it. Uh, empathy, heard about empathy. Empathy is a way in which you, not the same as compassion, because you can reenact and get inside the other persons and understand their values and the way they're working. Well, you certainly don't have that in the regime south of us. Even-handedness, fairness. Um, what you have, on the other hand, is protectionism, not even-handedness. You have, I'll quickly go through the, a few more. Uh, uh, we heard the slogan, lock her up. And the her is very important, not simply Hillary, because behind it was a symbolism of what you do with women. And what you do in the opposite civil religion of Canada is women have to play a very predominant part. And it's very important, and it's part of the religion and part of our civil religion, and it's expressed to some degree in our government. Yesterday, John talked about being fair-minded, impartial versus neutral. And impartiality is very important. But what do you have uh, south of the border in the uncivil religion is ruthlessness, not, uh, not fair-mindedness. Um, we talk about freedom as a goal, but the freedom means something much different uh, here than there. The freedom there is to make yourself into whatever you want. The freedom here is to do something with others and has much more of an intersubjective relationship, has much more with uh, some of the philosophy in Canada that has become predominant. But behind this all, and I don't have any more time, I'll end with, false consciousness. Because whereas they have falseness on the table south of us, outright lies, uh, alternative facts if you want to call them that way, it's a lying regime. We didn't have yesterday mentioned truth. I didn't hear the word all day. Because we too have a false consciousness. We paint ourselves as nice guys, nice Canadians. And everybody will tell you Canadians are nice. You go to the international conference. Don't they say that? All of our other societies. In but in this niceness, we hide our own lack of things. And if we get time, I'll talk about some of them. Thank you. Thank you very much to all three of our panelists. Karen, we uh, started a little late. What, what's our target end time for this? I'm going to put you on the spot. You put me on the spot this time. I did. <laughs> uh, we are saying, well, ten people want to talk here or not, you see. Quarter after. Quarter after. It gives us, that gives us 20 minutes. So. Um, Let's have, um, there's lots of material there. Let's have uh, short questions and direct answers. Who's first? Go ahead, ma'am. Introduce yourself, please. Um, hi, I'm Bel Jarnaski, and I'm the uh, president of the Manitoba Multi Faith Council and also the chair of the Holocaust Education Center and a member of the steering committee of Operation Ezra. Um, I just wanted to. Um, um, 
make a, a short comment. I'm going to be pres presenting right after this um, on Operation Ezra. Um, I wanted to say, uh, Dr. Martin, that um, Operation Ezra actually uh, began um, project to bring in the CDs back in 2015 and um, has uh, worked uh, very closely with the government since then, has brought in many museum families, has um, worked on uh, together with uh, parliamentary committees, and um, has uh, been closely uh, working on um, trying to convince the government to um, that, that there was a genocide um, and actually predated um, you know, anything that was done in these CDs. And I, I wanted, and I'll be, I'll, I, I don't want to go you know, too far on that just because I will be making this presentation. But um, we have raised half a million dollars, and our greatest uh, challenge is the caps on the spots, which you um, alluded to. And uh, I wondered if uh, any of you have any suggestions as to what we can do. Because obviously, I mean, the government has said we are bringing in um, 1,000 to 1,200 Yazidis. But clearly, um, you know, you have um, said, uh, which we all know, that it is much better for um, um, refugees to be brought in as, uh, with private sponsorship the support is much better, um, and the success is better for uh, privately sponsored refugees. So what can we do? Um, we are now in a situation where the number of spots is so limited that we're sitting here with families. We have so many families that are desperate to come in, but we can't because there are no spots for them. So what can we do? to convince the government to increase those numbers well. Dr. Mark, do you want to pick up on that first? Yeah. So <clears throat> thank you for the comment and the question. Basically, uh, I, I fully agree with you. We were extremely pleased to see that under Project Abraham with Mozud, the first uh, um, Yazidi family in our program arrived by Canada Day last year as a result of lengthy processing and everything. The caps are a serious problem. However, now the government is uh, allowing to bring and even refer cases under the IDP program, the internally displaced program from Northern Iraq. So I think it's worth it to connect with Immigration Canada because th there are still spots which they didn't fill uh, up and we can uh, try to identify cases for that. However, uh, you are right that the caps is actually crippling the whole initiatives. And there are two ways to go. One is community sponsorship, which is unlimited right now. And I don't know what the government is planning to do because um, uh, they don't have a concept how to deal with it. However, if a refugee is recognized as a conventional refugee by the United Nations or by a, a government outside of Canada, then this refugee can be sponsored, can be resettled under the so-called community sponsorship uh, program. So we recommend to do that until Immigration Canada will find how to, <laughs> how to stop that also. The other thing is the so-called uh, public policy. Public policy is a very secretive way how to bring <laughs> migrants to Canada. And if we can work out maybe jointly a proposal to the minister for consideration. Usually they are positive on that way, that when there is a community willing to identify a community in need, we have the resources and the preparedness, we can uh, submit a proposal just for that community. So maybe that's the way to go. Professor Edelman or Rita, anything on, on the caps or community versus? Um, I think you're quite right. The caps are um, uh, a problem. We are also uh, Manitoba Interfaith, uh, a sponsorship agreement holder, and uh, not just for uh, you know uh, this year, but in general, um, we have been getting that feedback from the communities that the need for increasing the caps from from a, uh, other other parts of the world. Um, in terms of um, uh, you know providing support, we've certainly been working with uh, um, Project Ezra in, in Winnipeg with you, and um, I can only make a commitment that um, we will continue to support um, in whichever way we can 
uh, the the efforts and work that that your organization is involved with. Um, I think if they're you know well, I'm respectfully um, say this that you know certainly the service providers uh, are also working very very hard to ensure that um, um, uh, you know people that are brought into the government assisted program uh, are also well settled. But I think it's important for us to work together with the communities to ensure that um, the, the integration is, is long term. So I think that, you know, to, I'm not sure I agree with all of the research that, you know, one group is better settled than the other. Uh, there's yes and no's to that, and I'd say that very respectfully. Um, but I think it's very important to work with the community. Perfect. I can else? tell you a story about, about the Yazidis. Um, first of all, just to comment on Winnipeg, Manitoba is the central of the, of the civic religion of Canada because the conscience of Canada comes from Winnipeg primarily. Uh, uh, and all kinds of research would show that. Uh, and the prairies more generally, um, as opposed to Toronto or Quebec. Uh, but it's true. <laughs> uh, but secondly, when we were set out to lobby, this is a former director of settlement and a former ambassador and head of the refugee program in Ottawa, uh, and myself on, this is four or five years ago, when we started working on the Syrian refugees and developing a policy, and we developed practices, uh, test uh, sites in Calgary and in Halifax, with the idea that uh, we bring in refugee under the temporary worker program because mm -hmm. the temporary worker program was almost 450,000 of which uh, the lower group were over 100,000 and if you could bring in refugees that way it was a practical mis you know guiding of the government when we were dealing with them and we proved that the private enterprise would be partner with us because they were far more eager to have refugees than temporary workers um, we didn't know that till we did our research. Uh, we went to the government, and the government didn't want Syrians. We had to leave the word out of the proposal on the advice of senior civil servants. Yazidis were okay, and that's the reference to it, because they thought that Yazidis were Christians. Uh, and that was the reason that we could put them in. Uh, so you have this kind of thing as how do you uh, manipulate the government? If, but my own thing, <laughs> my own situation, my own v uh, view of it is we're much weaker now because the religious faith communities are much weaker. And whereas there was a real partnership with secular society, which is much more powerful, uh, back in 79, that's withered away because the secular society doesn't have continuing commitment in the same way that the faith community has. So if you look at the charities that the young people give to, uh, they're very different patterns. They're very good people, they're very generous, but they don't give to refugees. I did research on it to find out why. They don't think of refugees. And unless we really attack that problem of why our civic religion is failing in that way, then I don't think we will have the political force to get the government to take many, many more refugees. Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Frances Gabrielle. I'm with First Unitarian Ottawa. And uh, um, my experience of the uh, Syrian refugee event, I, I found it very peculiar that the government uh, this separation of government-sponsored refugees and privately-sponsored refugees seemed so crazy to me. We had uh, million, uh, thousands of refugees coming in and staying in motels, and there was no place for them to live, and they were government-sponsored, and they had no one supporting them. And we had faith communities and other groups that just formed to bring in refugees. Um, holding spaces, and they couldn't get their refugees here. Uh, and they couldn't go and visit the government's country refugees. And I thought, what is structurally wrong with this picture? Is there any way we can do something about it? I mean, it seemed 
it was all about John McCallum meeting his goals. And if we brought in refugees, that didn't meet his goals. Why didn't it? Some insight on the difference between the government-sponsored and the community-sponsored refugees? Yes, uh, the civic resettlement, as we call it, private sponsorship, must be um, an additionality on the government commitment. So it's a very important principle that uh, the government should not be excused from their job to, to provide assistance and, and help refugees in need. Also, it is uh, somehow identified that refugees under the government program uh, uh, can be referred by the United Nations, so the United Nations count on that they can identify the refugees who come. However, uh, life is more complicated and we have a lot of people who have relatives, friends, community members, or like we had even police officers coming to us who work together with Iraqi police officers that time and they want to resettle them and so on. So, uh, this is uh, basically competition, like very, very difficult, like generally like less than 1% of the refugees can be resettled. And usually worldwide now the average waiting time for getting resettlement is about 20 years. So it means the refugees spend about 20 years in a, in a camp uh, on an average base uh, before they resettle. However, now in the Yazidi program, for instance, there is a cooperation, so it means that uh, the government referred the cases under the JAS program, the Joint Assistance Sponsorship, but exactly to avoid this mistake, the, the sponsors will be matched with, with the refugees upon arrival, visit them, take them, help them, and to do the joint effort as something above and beyond. Okay, what I'll do is I'm going to give one response to each and then at the very end I'll let each of the panel have a wrap up if there's anything that you didn't have a chance to jump in on. That way we can get, because there were several hands there. So go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Hi, my name is Sheila Yan. I'm a member of the Chinese community. I'm a refugee myself. I'm came in the end of the 70s. And uh, we as a result of a program to settle uh, Baha'is all over the world that were stranded, uh, they would come, we were in Maritimes, and uh, they would come They would come to our home, and from there we go to different uh, places. My question is, um, uh, is there a forum, excuse my ignorance, but is there a forum for uh, faith communities to share their experiences of what has been successful and what has not been, so that we can learn from each other, and it, it somehow also empowers smaller communities to take on more refugees. Rita, are you able to? Thank you. That's a very good question and a very good comment. I think absolutely there is a need for a dialogue and a forum where we can uh, learn. Uh, we, as in those who provide services, uh, service providers, but also those who make those decisions and policy decisions around it. I think it's absolutely critical um, that the experience and the best practices that have happened in the community. I, I think the Canadian um, settlement model today exists um, where uh, at, at the level that it does because people who have experienced it have contributed to developing that that model. You know, when when. Uh, uh, Going back to um, when my parents arrived, there was no such thing as a settlement model in Canada. You know, we just, we arrived and, and we were very fortunate because we had personal um, uh, um, support from uh, individuals and we be became engaged and, and we were part of the faith community that, that existed and we were familiar with some of those. So that, but I think the, the settlement model today exists because people have contributed and that dialogue needs to be continued and learning from the best practices of how, how, how people have, and, and I do believe that the, the bureaucrats need to know that a bit better. We have time for maybe two, maybe three more questions. I, there were a few hands there. Dave? Uh, thank you all for your comments. Uh, Howard, I wanted to ask you, do you have any suggestions or more thoughts on how we can, I mean, there's so much to whine about the situation regarding refugees. Our, our church sponsors are an Iraqi family, uh, but it, it's a whole story. Uh, I, I'm just interested, what do we do? Because I realize the government can only process so many, et cetera. It's, it's a very, but it's a very deep problem, I think, and it's persistent. And we still have communities all over Canada that don't have the refugee family yet. And they've been waiting for a year, year and a half. 
And I'm just curious, there's a whole dialogue that's going on this, but I just, you, you brought some, I think, very important comments on this. I'm curious if you have any more to say. Oh, lots more. Uh, <laughs> we don't have enough time for all I have to say. Um, but just to get a little bit of insight into it, uh, and related back to the question on private versus uh, government sponsorship, that originated in the 70s legislation. The private sponsorship was introduced in the back door uh, as a result of the Jewish community wanting to sponsor uh, some Soviet Jews. The estimate was maybe 100 to 200 people would come in, and it was slipped in as a paragraph. But the civil servants, no, not the public, came up with the idea, let's use that for the Indo-Chinese refugees. And they sold it to the Mennonites and the Dutch Reformed Church, couldn't sell it to any other church at the time, uh, and then sold it to when we organized Operation Lifeline, because it was their idea, who they just showed up at our meeting on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, now, if you take it to the, and that grew, and, he, and grew enormously, and it became a very important thing. You have to say, well, why, when we came to the new situation, when we have welcome houses all across Canada, we didn't have them in 79, there was none of this, you have many, many more resources, were they not able to do nearly as much? Well, one reason is the immigration department had been run down. Uh, the p experience of the people weren't there because there was a determination uh, officially to reduce that whole uh, segment of the thing. And then when the liberal government gets in and gets reelected, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, the two chop civil servants did, but the, the inexperience was so evident, it, it was uh, uh, really awful. So, and, you, and you have inexperience in the lower ranks. You don't have a whole train lower ranks and so you need three times the number of people. Also, you have the problem of the way refugees come in. They're very scattered now from all sources, and so it takes much more work. It's a complex problem, but the key part of it is the political will is there. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a reduction in the numbers last year versus this year. And the political will is not there because there's not enough pressure that all the faith communities can together bring on the government to make them change when there's other pressures to do other things. So unless you can get a real partnership with the secular society in a much bigger way, I don't think you're, we're going to go, continue to go downhill in the number of refugees we can bring in. And that's tragic because it'll reverberate eventually on our civic religion because you are the keepers of our civic religion, which is in danger, as you can see all over the world. Rita uh, wants to jump in. And I just want to add, um, you know, I would echo absolutely the comment that you've, you've made, um, but I want to add that after the Syrian um, initiative, there was this uh, analysis um, of, you know, how, how did we do, how did the government do, how did the, the, the agencies do, and one of the key things that came out of those analyses, and those analyses happened at the federal level, those analyses happened at the provincial level, and, and, and some agencies like ours did it very much at the local level. And the one thing that we, we all reiterated, um, it, you know, it was common, was that the need for the government to have engaged with the community um, in how this should have been carried out. It was, again, somebody mentioned that, you know, it was Mr. McCollum's desire to continue just getting the numbers in. But we did try to put some brakes on that and some caution and say, listen, you need to talk to the service providers. How are you going to handle this? And many of us said, this has been done before. Let's pick, take from, from those best practices. But, you know, again, I don't want to take too much against the government because they fund me. Um, <laughs> But um, there, there was the need for caution and, and the need for engage in, in a dialogue before some of this, this happened. Okay, we have four minutes and then there's coffee. So Anita, a 30 second question and we'll give each of you a minute to respond. Oh, good question. Um, Anita Broderick, can you raise your questions? Um, I, I wanted to change uh, a little bit of focus and try to be brief in your answers. Um, you mentioned Anita, that um, let me call it important conflicts. Uh, do you think that's what's 
I'm not sure if I use the word um, uh, appropriately conflict, but I think there are competing forces, um, and often there, again, this is my personal view, that they might be personal agendas, um, you know, people getting engaged in leadership positions within different communities and buying for the same um, clientele as members. And so there are within within the ethnocultural community, most of them are made up by, by various faith groups, you know, with, uh, as an East Indian, for example, as, as one that I'm most familiar with. You've got the Hindus, you've got Muslims, you've got Christians, you've got South Indians, you've got Bengalis, you've got a whole bunch. And so they're all vying for, for different, um, um, you know, uh, positioning. Um, and so it becomes confusing, I think, for, for some of, sometimes the, the newcomers as to where they might might end up, and, and that causes some dissension. So I think that, that's what I was trying to think of. Great. Martin, final words? Well, I, I think that the most important, uh, two weeks from now, the uh, sponsors of Canada, the sponsorship agreement holders, will sit together in Edmonton, um, all the 110 organizations. 80% of them are Christian organizations. So I think it's time to open up and uh, try to see how other communities could also participate in the discussion. Right now, uh, as a result of uh, Immigration Canada announced in two, 10 years ago in, in Manitoba that they will facilitate the program to make sure that processing time is, is uh, fair and short and everything. The 10-year result is right now Immigration Canada with the refugees uh, in the federal program and in the Quebec program is 55,000 people in the backlog. Yeah. So that shows that if we continue like this, I think that the bureaucrats, they want to reduce the numbers of the intake to ensure that they, they work out the backlog. Our approach is different. Uh, we worked out with Canada for Refugees as a proposal to the government of Canada, double the numbers in this year, and that could eliminate the backlog, that could bring here the refugees who are still waiting and suffering, and could come to the international standards as Australia or other countries processing refugees within one year. Thank you. Okay. Final word to you, Howard. Uh, one factor, I could have named a number, but one factor uh, influencing the back change is immigration. We did research on a high-rise tower in, in north uh, western Toronto, and there were three dominant ethnic groups there. And the racism there compares, was much more severe among those three uh, ethnic groups against each other than I've ever experienced against Jews in Canada as a kid growing up or against anyone else. Yesterday it was mentioned that Jews were at the front line of the most. Well, it isn't. It's if you go into the uh, equivalent to the um, uh, suburbs of Paris, it's similar here where you have groups living in isolation and we bring in so many immigrants and those immigrants themselves bring in their own coherent, uh, because they got their help from their own immigrants. Uh, and it doesn't matter which group, uh, I find, if they live in insular lives, then they aren't w interested in bringing others. They're interested in bringing their own families. And so if you add up them just numerically, you're missing all their power and all their energy. So if you talk about being a civ civil religion, and I think you are, if, if I could convince you, take a day maybe, uh, then you have to embrace other people and say, how do we get all these other people involved in the civil religion that you've been espousing here? Great. We didn't have a day, but we did have an hour, and I think uh, Rita Shahal, Professor Edelman, and Dr. Mark did a tremendous job of informing us. Join me in thanking them.